What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. All right, guys, so we are going to continue our coverage over the Battle of the Cow storyline. Now, remember, this was a storyline that was basically spinning out of what happened in Final Crisis. Now, of course, Final Crisis was written by Grant Morrison. It was one of the craziest storylines of all time. But in that storyline, you also had the death of Batman. And so with the death of Batman, you basically had Gotham go into complete chaos. And so the Battle of the Cow is really more of who is going to become the next Batman. Now you did have the main storyline series, which was only three issues and that is it, but you did have a bunch of tie-ins as well to focus on the different characters in Batman's life who's affected with the idea that Batman is basically no longer around. And so we're going to cover all the different tie-ins except like one of them, but we're going to cover most of the tie-ins plus the main storyline for this event right here, this Batman event. Now there's only 17 issues, so honestly, we should be done in like four or five videos and that's it. Now we already covered three in our last video. In today's video, we're going to cover three more. Now, in today's video, we're going to cover a couple one-shots that were basically focusing on different characters in the Battle of the Cow storyline. So, for example, one of the one-shots is called Battle of the Cow Commissioner Gordon, which, of course, is about Commissioner Gordon. Another one is about Man Bat. And then we're going to cover Oracle the Cure. Now, Oracle the Cure is actually a three-part miniseries that ties into Battle of the Cow. But in this video right here, we're only going to cover the first issue of that miniseries along with the two one-shots I mentioned earlier, which is Commissioner Gordon and the Man Bat uh, one-shot as well. Now, when it comes to Oracle the Cure number one, we have to remember where this story actually takes place in the DC timeline. And what I mean is that it takes place before the New 52, which means that Oracle, Barbara Gordon, is just Oracle. She's no longer Batgirl. And the reason why I'm telling you guys this, because when it came to the pre-New 52, yes, Barbara Gordon was Batgirl, but after the Killy Joke storyline, she basically ended up paralyzed for years to come. Now, of course, they did make her Oracle, the computer person in the Bat family, to give her character a new kind of purpose, which honestly, a lot of Batman fans love the idea for that character and me as well. But I want you guys to realize that this takes place before the New 52 where DC once again made her Batgirl again and no longer Oracle. And then later on, they gave her both titles. But for right now, she's just Oracle, the computer person in the Bat family. Now at this point in the DC timeline, she just came back to Gotham. And with her coming back to Gotham, she picked the worst time. Because right now, Batman is dead. Gotham is completely falling off. You have chaos everywhere. And with that chaos, people right now are having issues with their electricity, where power is just going out left and right. But either way, though, she's back at Gotham where she feels like she belongs. Because again, she is Oracle. Now, with that being said, she's also going to dinner with her father, Commissioner Gordon. Now, something else I do want to mention is that in the pre-New 52 time line, she is actually the adoptive daughter of Commissioner Gordon, not his biological, his adoptive daughter. And I want you guys to know that because when we jump over to the Commissioner Gordon one shot, it's actually mentioned that she is his adoptive daughter, not his biological one, where most DC fans, I feel like, who are not hardcore to comics, do not actually know that about the characters at all.
Now, we actually do jump over to one of the many hospitals in Gotham City. Now, when we do, we actually pick up with a character known as Wendy White. Now, Wendy White is actually a character who first appeared back in, I want to say, Teen Titans number 34. But she was kind of like on the Teen Titans team, but not really a hero, more kind of like an associate. She kind of helped the team out with different things. And she also was an assistant to Batgirl, or sorry, Barbara Gordon later on. Either way, though, back in the Teen Titans series, while she was hiding out in Titan Tower, she was actually attacked by the Wonder Dog. And so when she was attacked by Wonder Dog, it basically left her in a coma ever since then. And so right now in Gotham, you do have the doctors trying to find different ways to kind of help her come out of her coma. Now, she's also the daughter of the Calculator. Now, he is a character where most DC fans may have heard of here and there, but honestly, he's not that hugely important now in DC Comics, but he is for this storyline right here. Because basically, when it comes to the Calculator, he is like this guy who's just great at math. And he used his great skills in math to do different things when he's confronted by a superhero. Now, with that being said, though, he did pop up here and there in Final Crisis, but he wasn't that important in Final Crisis. But he's going to be really important for this storyline because he's the main bad guy. Either way, though, right now, you do have the calculator very upset to see his daughter right now in a coma, and he's hoping to actually find a way to help her out of her coma. Now, his bright idea is to use the anti-life equation. Now, this is why I say Final Crisis is going to be somewhat important for the storyline because this comes right after Final Crisis. Because remember, Final Crisis was really all about the idea that Darkseid had finally found the anti-life equation. And when he used the anti-life equation, he was basically able to break the willpower of the people of Earth and make them do whatever he wanted them to do. And so with the anti-life equation, it's the calculator thinking that maybe there is a way for him to use just part of the anti-life equa equation to hopefully help his daughter wake out of her coma. But then we jump back over to Barbara Gordon. Now, when we do, we actually do see Barbara Gordon right now having dinner with her father, but she's not really there. And what I mean by that is, yes, she is sitting there right next to him right now in person, but her mind is somewhere else. She is constantly thinking about something else rather than actually talking to her father. And he realized that. He's kind of like, okay, I don't know what's going on with you right now, but I do realize realize that you're not ready to actually talk to me about it. So when you are ready to talk to me about it, come find me. But I'm going to go ahead and take you back home right now. Now, of course, we kind of find out that basically what she's thinking about is her legs. Because even though she's been paralyzed for years now in DC Comics, it's still something that's on her mind. And she always thinks back to the killing joke. And she always wonders if something could have been done differently, maybe she'll still have her legs or she could have been dead. Because right now, she hates the idea of being alive and being trapped in a wheelchair. She's kind of like, what if I just moved to the left a tad bit? Maybe I would have kept my legs or maybe I would have died. And honestly, one of those two things are better than where I am right now in life where basically I'm stuck in a wheelchair and I just can't do much because I'm in a wheelchair. Now we do see her kind of log on to her Oracle system where we see that she does have other people across the world that de she does communicate with who are also hackers, but they kind of like work for her. And so her code name is Oracle and the other hackers have different code names as well, but they all work for her. And we do see that one of the hacker's name is Cheese Fiend. And honestly, Cheese Fiend's real name doesn't really matter because I'll tell you right now, by the end of this issue right here, she won't be around that much longer 
for us to even care who she actually is. But it does give us the chance to see that basically Barbara Gordon does have other hackers around the earth who basically work for her. They all have different code names. But of course, again, they all work for Barbara Gordon. But then we pick up with the calculator. Now, when we do, we have to remember that the calculator is trying to bring his daughter out of her coma. And so what he does is that basically he does go to this random building. Now, when he does, he pretends that he works for this company. Now, the way he does it is actually pretty interesting because usually at night, the only people who work there are just a bunch of janitors and that is it. And so what he does, he goes there at night, he gets on the elevator, but before he does that, he does talk to at least one of the janitors. And then he goes up the elevator, he waits somewhere on a different floor where usually the janitors do not go to, and then he comes back down hours later so that it does look like to this one guy on the bottom floor who just cleans the floor that this guy, the calculator actually works for this company, but in reality, he doesn't. And so when it comes time for him to finally use this company's computer system as a way to basically find the anti-life equation, he has to get a key card into their main server. And so to this janitor, he's kind of like, oh yeah, you work here. I seen you here the last two weeks. Let me go ahead and use my key card because you forgot yours to let you into the main server room. Now, when he gets inside there, of course, he's looking for the anti-life equation on the internet because we have to remember back in Final Crisis, that was how the anti-life equation was spread across the world thanks to the internet. And so this is him hoping that he can still find some part of the equation on the internet. Now he does find out that basically Cheese Fiend, one of the hackers who works for Gordon, does know something about the anti-life equation. But he's wondering how in the world can he get that information from her so that he can use it to save his daughter's life. And so that is when he realized, hmm, Cheese Fiend loves to play video games, virtual world video games. What if I meet her in this virtual world and be able to actually get that information from her so I can save my daughter's life? And so he sends her an invite to this one of these top video games that you can only get into if you have been invited. Now, Cheese Fiend does get the invite and she's very excited and she does know that basically the person who sent her that invite is asking for part of the anti-life equation code. Now, you do have Cheese Fiend tell Barbara Gordon about this invite and at first you have Gordon kind of like, hmm, maybe it's nothing. But then she realized that Cheese Fiend is basically offering part of the anti-life equation but on top of that, the person that she is going to meet, the name sounds very familiar that Oracle should know who that person actually is. Now, it's not the calculator using his name, calculator, as the invite name. He actually uses his real name, which I forgot right now. But you do have Oracle realize that something about that name seems off. Now, you do have Cheese Fiend say that she is going to accept the invite to go into this virtual world. And so you have Barbara Gordon actually contact another hacker who works for her. And this hacker would be, uh, I think his name is, I forgot his name. Oh, it's Chaos Larry. That's right, Chaos Larry. It was a weird name. Either way, though, you do have Chaos Larry being contacted by Oracle to basically follow Cheese Fiend into this virtual world to make sure that nothing happens to her. So you do have Cheese Fiend actually meet up with the calculator in this virtual world. Now, when they actually do meet up, of course, with this being a virtual world, being a video game, they're able to be whatever they want to be. And so for Calculator, he's more kind of like your James Bond kind of character, just with gray hair. And then you have Cheese Fiend being like the Xenon, the warrior princess kind of. Yes, I know I just showed my age right there, but hey, Xenon the Warrior Princess was a good show back in the day. 
Either way, though, you basically do have these two characters right now meeting up. And remember, this is the calculator basically asking Cheese Fiend to share what she had found, which is the anti-life equation. Not the entire equation, but just part of the anti-life equation. And so... This is her kind of like, yeah, man, I have what you need. Here is the technology or here is the data I found when it comes to the anti-life equation. Now, as soon as he's able to get that data from her and download it, he basically makes sure he has a way to kill her off in real life. Yes, you heard that right. Because even though right now they're meeting in this virtual world, and yes, he was able to get the anti-life equation, not the entire thing, but part of it as data to download to his computer, he's still a great guy when it comes to math. And so he used his math skills as a way to send some kind of pulse through the virtual world to the headset of Cheese Fiend to basically make her head explode. And so he kills off Cheese Fiend just like that once he was able to get the anti-life equation information that he was looking for. Now, as soon as she died, of course, you have Barbara Gordon realize the name does sound familiar because the name belongs to the calculator. And so when she goes to try to warn Cheese Fiend about meeting up with this guy in the virtual world, she's too late. She already died. Her head had exploded because once again, calculator was able to send some kind of pulse through her headset to basically make her head explode. And so he made sure to cover up his tracks and get away once again with pieces of the anti-life equation. Now, we actually do jump over to the next chapter in the Battle of the Cow storyline, where we actually do pick up with the one-shot for Commissioner Gordon. Now, this one-shot may seem kind of out of nowhere, because honestly, it is Commissioner Gordon, but we have to realize that when it comes to Batman comics, a lot of the side characters do really matter a lot in Batman comics. But when it comes to all the different side characters besides like Robin, Nightwing, Batgirl, or even like, you know, Catwoman, Commissioner Gordon is also up there as well, after Alfred as well. But either way though, Commissioner Gordon is still a very important character for this storyline, especially when it comes to the city that he swore to protect. And so it's kind of like, it makes sense on why they would give him a one shot. Now, when we actually do pick up with Commissioner Gordon, we come to find out that basically he has been captured and he has been captured by Mr. Freeze. But then we pick up with Detective Bullock. Now remember, Detective Bullock was basically this cop, part of the GCPD. He was always with Commissioner Gordon anytime they went to a crime scene. And of course that crime scene was caused by a super villain that's going to lead into Batman battling against him down the road. But usually Detective Bullock is kind of like always there for me personally as kind of like the comedy relief. You know, he comes with his jokes sometimes and then he's gone for the rest of the show or the rest of the book. Either way though, right now with Detective Bullock, we're able to realize how bad Gotham is right now because he's not really being that jokester anymore even though we saw him be somewhat funny in our last video. But in this video, in this storyline right now, he's not being funny because he's ticked off with everything happening right now in Gotham left and right. Now you do have the commissioner walk in and when Gordon walks in, we can see right off the bat that Gordon is ticked off. Everybody in the police department can tell that something is wrong with Gordon. And so you do have Bullock go check up on Gordon. And when he does, you have Gordon tell Bullock that he just had a meeting with the mayor. And the mayor was wondering how in the past was the GCPD able to control these super villains. And uh, Gordon had to tell the mayor they did nothing that basically every time a super villain attacked Gotham, 
Batman was the one to stop them. But now with Batman gone, the question is right now, can the GCPD actually capture the super villains who are causing chaos across Gotham at the moment. Now, after that section right there, the GCPD did get word that basically Mr. Freeze has been found and right now he's holed up in some kind of warehouse because in this storyline so far, we are told that basically Mr. Freeze has been going around to different uh, warehouses across Gotham stealing different things that he needs for his next big plan to do to Gotham City. And so you do have Commissioner Gordon, Bullock, and also some other members of the GCPD go confront Mr. Freeze. Now the problem is though, when they actually go to confront Mr. Freeze, of course it was basically a trap because as soon as they walk in trying to hopefully stop him and arrest him, Homeboy pulls out his freeze gun and basically frees most of the GCPD and their tracks. But in the chaos, he was also able to grab Commissioner Gordon. And so that is how we know or that's how we figure out how in the world Mr. Freeze was able to grab Commissioner Gordon. And so with that last section being done, now we know how in the world Commissioner Gordon was able to be captured by Mr. Freeze. Now with all that being said though, you do have Mr. Freeze right now telling Commissioner Gordon why he captured Gordon for. And the reason why, because it's Mr. Freeze want to tell Gordon his master plan. The usual bad guy thing. Tell some good guy what you're trying to actually do because right now they need to know apparently. And so you do have Mr. Freeze tell Commissioner Gordon, hey man, listen, what I'm trying to do right now is basically give the tools Gotham needs to deal with the grieving they're going through right now. And what he means about grieving is about the idea that Batman is dead. Because usually everybody goes through a grieving moment in their life. When you lose something or lose somebody, you grieve over that person or over that thing that you have basically lost. And so what Mr. Freeze saying that, Thanks to his life being a supervillain, he was able to learn how to grieve over the situation with his wife. Commissioner Gordon has also learned how to grieve over different things in his life, like losing his wife or watching his daughter get paralyzed and now figuring out that Batman is not going to be here to help him protect Gotham. And so that is what Mr. Freeze is saying right now, that with Batman gone right now, Commissioner Commissioner Gordon knows how to deal with grief because he went through so much. Other people in Gotham City, though, do not know how to deal with grief like Gordon has. And so it's Mr. Free saying that he's going to use some kind of huge ice bomb to basically hurt Gotham even more, but to help Gotham learn how to get over their grieving because right now, yes, Batman is gone, but you must be stronger now to basically move on from the idea that Batman is not going to come back. Now, once Mr. Freeze does explain to Commissioner Gordon why in the world he is attacking Gotham City, you do have Gordon actually being able to break free from his binds to actually take down Mr. Freeze. Now, it's not like it's Commissioner Gordon being able to overpower Mr. Freeze so easily. It's really more of Commissioner Gordon using his surroundings as a way to kind of help him defeat Mr. Freeze. But once he's able to use his surroundings and begin the process of blowing up the warehouse as a way to kind of send a signal to the rest of the GCPD who are trying to find Commissioner Gordon after he was captured by Mr. Freeze, once they see a building blow up, they realize that has to be Gordon. Let's go help him out and hopefully bring down Mr. Freeze. And so while you have the rest of the GCPD going to the location that Mr. Freeze and Gordon are at, you have Gordon continue to take down Mr. Freeze. Now, really, this one shot is showing that even though Gotham City right now no longer have their hero and are also going through a moment where basically the city is in complete chaos, you still have other characters out 
out there who will still try their best to defend the city. Even the ones who were not trained by Batman like Nightwing, Robin, or even Batgirl. That you have other characters out there who are still going to put their life on the line to help protect Gotham because that is what they want to do. They want to see Gotham get better. And so when it comes to this one shot, it's really showing that Gordon is not just that character on the sideline who just calls up Batman anytime things pop off. He's not that character who basically sits on the sideline and tries to make sure that his daughter is okay every time Gotham goes into complete chaos. That right now he is somebody who's actually capable of doing something to protect Gotham. Now, the next one shot we are going to cover is the Man Bat one shot. Now, to be honest, I found this one very random. And the reason why, because we went from Oracle to Commissioner Gordon to Man Bat. And honestly, for me, Man Bat, out of all the different villains out there in Gotham City, he's not my least favorite, but he's one where it's kind of like, it wouldn't make sense to give him a one-shot story where he's basically affected with how Gotham is right now. But here we are. Now, with that being said, we actually pick up with this dream sequence. Now, the reason why we know it is a dream is because you do have Kurt Langstrom right now basically taking the serum. And that was kind of like his origin story where he made the serum for a different reason. But of course, when he took the serum, it turned him into a man bat creature and so in this dream we're seeing all over again where basically he takes the serum he turns into man bat and it's kind of like yo that's not a good sign but then his wife Francine walks in now as soon as she walks in he does cut her and we're left to believe that he is dead not he sorry she is dead and so when we see that happen it's kind of like oh my gosh he just killed his wife is this his origin story? But we have to remember that in the pre-New 52 timeline, when it came to Francine, she wasn't killed off by Kirk. Matter of fact, she also got the serum as well and became a half-bat, half-human creature. And on top of that, she had just joined the Outsiders, which was a team that Batman had put together. And so we, we can tell that this is a dream because in this sequence right now, he just killed his wife. But on top of that, Batman does appear and say, she is gone, Kirk. She left you, Kirk. She's gone. She's dead. Like, basically, we can tell this is a dream for those two reasons. One, his wife never died. But two, Batman's right there right now telling you that she's dead. Come on, it's a dream. Now, when you do have Kirk wake up from his dream, he does look for Francine, which tells us that, yes, she did not die. But on top of that, when he does wake up, she's not there. Now, it's not like because she laughed him or anything. It's really more of she just went out into Gotham to help out the outsiders. Because when he goes into her office, he does see that she was called in by Oracle. Because by this point in DC Comics, like I said earlier, she was part of the outsiders. And on top of that, I want to say he was too. Either way though, she got the call because right now Gotham is falling apart. There's no Batman around to help protect Gotham. And so with no Batman around, the bad guys feel like they should no longer be scared to do what they always wanted to do, which is attack Gotham in so many different ways. And so right now, Gotham has fallen into complete chaos and they need everybody hands on deck right now to handle this situation. And so Francine left to go help out the outsiders to go help protect Gotham. And so this is Kirk saying, okay, let me go ahead, take the serum, turn to Man Bat and hopefully find my wife because right now I have no idea what happened to her. It does seem like she left to go help the outsiders, but I want to make sure. Now, while you have Kurt going out there as Man Bat to look for his missing wife, 
he does run into a character known as Lynx. Now, this is actually the second Lynx. The first one appeared back in the early 1990s when Tim Drake became Robin. This Lynx right there took the name from the first one when the first one had died, and they both were part of the same group. That's all you need to know, really, because honestly, she's not that important for this storyline. She's really more important for the Red Robin series, if we ever actually cover the Red Robin series. Either way, though, right now, you do have basically Lynx being kind of overrun by a bunch of clowns in Gotham City, and you do have Man Bat come in and basically help her out. Now, right after he does that, they're both confronted by the Outsiders. And this was the group that Batman had put together. And right now, they're here to basically help protect Gotham. Because again, Oracle put that call out to everyone in Gotham to basically help out to protect Gotham. Now, with that being said, this is Man Bat kind of asking for their help to look for his missing wife. But then for some strange reason, he felt like that basically he's not fit enough to actually ask for their help or to actually work with them. And so you actually have Man Bat just go ahead and release a sonic burst to hurt their ears and basically he flies away. Now by using his sonar, he was actually able to locate his wife and he does figure out that his wife is actually at some kind of electrical plant and so when he goes over there he does run into a fence that has full of electricity and so of course he gets knocked out by it but right after that he's then confronted by somebody who knows him so well and they're kind of like dr langstrom thank you for finally being here now once kirk does wake up he does realize that basically he was kidnapped by somebody after he was knocked out by running into that electrical fence. And so when he wakes up, he realized that he's now bound to a chair. But on top of that, he has been blindfolded. Now, of course, he comes to meet the person who did that. And that is, and I'm going to butcher his name, so please forgive me. But the character name is Dr. Fosterfis. I really hope I pronounced that correctly. If not, please forgive me. But for the rest of the video, I'm going to call him Doctor. Now, when it comes to Dr. Foster Fist, I try one more time right there. But when it comes to the Doctor, basically, he was a character who was affected by nuclear radiation, bombs, all that stuff. Where basically, it turned him into a walking nuclear mutant. Now, because he is a walking nuclear mutant, all that radiation has affected his brain a whole lot and so most times when it comes to him thinking about stuff it's always about getting revenge on Gotham in some kind of way now with Batman being gone it's basically him going after the next thing close to Batman which is Man Bat now here is something else I may have forgotten to mention if I did cool if not let me go ahead and say it one more time when it comes to Kirk the Man Bat Kirk needs a serum to actually turn into Man Bat. And so when the doctor destroys the next container that Kirk had on him, just in case he does need to turn into Man Bat one more time, that basically cuts off the ability for Kirk to turn into Man Bat. Now we come to find out that basically the doctor was the one who had kidnapped Francine as a way to lure Man Bat here. Because again, with Batman being gone, Gotham has fallen into complete chaos. But for the doctor here, Foster Fist, his brainwaves is all about, hey, I want to get revenge on Gotham. But with Batman gone, I have to go after the next thing close to Batman, which is Man Bat. And so with that, you basically have the doctor say, I kidnapped Francine to bring you out here. Now, of course, right now he does find Francine because he is able to get out of his chair, find his wife, and they do try to escape. But the problem is though, without the container that hold the serum to turn Kirk into Man Bat, right now they're kind of like sitting ducks. Yes, they're able to run away in this warehouse, but when it comes to the doctor, he's able to use his different kinds of powers to basically blast at them. But then that is the moment 
um, you have Kirk be able to actually turn into Man Bat only because he saw his wife Francine get grabbed by the doctor and the doctor was about to kill her off. And so with that, he does turn into Man Bat and being able to do it without the serum is a very huge accomplishment. But either way though, once he does it, he's able to fight against the doctor, defeat the doctor, and him and Francine are then confronted by the Outsiders. And so you do have the Outsiders, Francine, and Alfred, which honestly, I think is Alfred. If it is Alfred, I have no idea why Homeboy is here right now. Either way, though, they're all surrounding Man Bat, Kirk, because they realize that he's able to now transform without the serum. And that right there is a very huge step in his evolution as a person or as a character. But at the same time, though, now he's scared of what he has become because it was OK with the idea of the serum being the way for him to turn into Man Bat. But now you're talking about the idea of turning into Man Bat at will. And for some strange reason, it does scare him and he runs away from his wife, the Outsiders and Alfred as well. And you have Alfred realize that this changed things completely when it comes to Man Bat. But with that being said, I do hope you enjoy today's comic book video. And if you do, please leave me a like down below and subscribe. But guys, I'll see y'all next time. Later.